I'm here to talk to you today about Flooring the World, um, which is a project looking at the history of linoleum in Fife. Apologies, I have my notes on my phone and they've just rotated. Um, so I've been in the job for three months and usually when somebody asks me what I do, an exchange similar to this simulation follows. Um, for a lot of people, lino isn't something that you'd expect to find in a museum or something that you necessarily think about at all. Um, its ubiquity throughout much of the 20th century means that it was overlooked in kitchens, ignored in hallways, and perhaps glanced at in public buildings. Um, and that means that for many of us, it's become quite literally part of the furniture um, and doesn't seem to warrant much study or contemplation. Um, by the end of this exchange with our imaginary straw man, which is simultaneously no one and everyone who I've spoken to about my work, um, I hit them with three quick facts that blow their lino ignorant minds. <laughs> which... Lino is not plastic, it's biodegradable. The future is here. It was invented in 1860. The future was a long time ago. <laughs> there was linoleum on the Titanic. Can you believe it? <laughs> um, so yeah, this is my big celebrity fact if the first two haven't done anything for them. Um, and yeah, the ship of dreams was and is um, literally riddled with linoleum in the third class, second class cabins, in the gym, and even on the grand staircase. So next time you'll rewatch James Cameron's, you know, masterpiece, I guess, <laughs> depending on your point of view, <laughs> you can think about that. Um, so this is usually enough to, why wouldn't this be enough to win over most people to think, most people in the pub at least, to think that lino is worth talking about? Um, there's no way a captive audience like the one I have now is going to get away with just that. Um, so to give you the context of linoleum industry in Fife, we're going to need a little bit more. And I'm also going to stop saying linoleum now because I will get it wrong. And so if any of you choose to use that word when you ask questions, you will also. So let's all go with lino. History of lino <laughs> in seven or eight slides. Um, so first of all, the, before we get to lino, we start with floor cloth, which was a precursor to lino. Um, so floor cloth was made basically with, you have started with a piece of canvas and you applied paint on either sides of it or um, a, not quite paint, sort of a resin, made of um, resin or pitch. And that would sort of make it stiff, but also a little bit bendy and waterproof. Um, and then designs were painted on top of that. Um, the first, um, so yeah, this is the first linoleum firm, in Kik lino firm in Kakadi began as a floor cloth firm. So that's Michael Nen. Um, Michael Nan and Company, and they began, had been manufacturing canvas since 1847 and branched out into floor cloth in the 1860s. Um, it was a natural extension to the business because canvas was already one of the raw materials that would go into it. Um, so Nan took out a large, large loan to extend his premises on coal wine to build a floor cloth factory, um, and this was considered quite a risky venture at the time um, because the product has to be aged for two to three weeks um, if not longer, several weeks before it can actually be sold. So it'd be quite a long time before he would actually be able to sell any of the things that he was making. Um, legend has it that these new works were dubbed Nairn's Folly by those in the town who thought they knew better. Um, there's no record for this at the time, and it's probably a later invention, but anybody that works in local history will tell you not to let that get in the way of a good story. Um, this example comes from the Lang Museum, Lang Museum sorry, in Newborough, um, and this was laid in about 1890. Um, and this is my feet when I visit it, visited it back in March. It's still going strong, so that tells you something about the durability of this, um, this material. Um, moving on, now we get to actual lino. Um, so we're going to have to break the rule. Linoleum gets its name um, from its main ingredient, which is linseed oil. So the lin is from linseed and the oleum is oil. Um, this was sort of adds a greater flexibility um, to, the, to the sort of raw material of floor cloth, although it's made in a very similar way. Um, it was invented in 1855 by a, um, British, an English inventor called Frederick Walton, and he patented it in 1860. Um, he soon lost control of his invention, basically because he had patented, I believe, the, patented the process, but not the name, and other people were able to retrofit this process and work it out for themselves. Um, and he took them to court, um, and they ruled against him and said the, the brand now is too big for to, you to sort of recall it in the same way that we use some brand names now, like we say a Hoover instead of a vacuum or tend to. It was the same kind of thing. So linoleum had just got out of his hands and he couldn't, couldn't call it back. Um, the first linoleums were, you would add, um, again, so you begin with canvas, which over which you lay a substance which is called cement, um, which is just kind of like sludge. Um, and it's made, again, of oil, 
resin um, and uh, cork dust. Um, and you also then add pigment at that stage. So these ground colours, so the brown on this one and the green on this one, that would have pigment all the way through. And then these designs would be printed on top. Um, the designs are printed using print blocks, Ooh, sorry, which are about this size um, and just wooden with uh, brass um, metal nails uh, hammered through them. So each, in the same way that if you had like a tile repeat design on a computer, you would just have to lay each block each time and you would have a different block for each color. So you can see from these complicated designs how laborious of a process that might be, especially because uh, Lino was produced in um, lengths of, I think about 150 meters at a time. So if you imagine how long it would take to do that, again, on top of that aging process, this is definitely a product which takes time <laughs> to produce and is potentially uh, costs a lot of outlay um, at, at, the, um, at the onset. These early designs, as you can tell from these ones, were mimicking um, other products which were more expensive, um, so carpet and tile. Um, and because they were still, despite that long time that it takes to make it, they're still a cheaper alternative to those products. So they quickly became popular in the sort of growing middle classes at the end of the 19th century. Um, yeah. <laughs> So here are some examples of Lino from our collections. Um, these are all really bad pictures taken on my phone, um, but I thought you'd want to see them. Um, so part of what I'm doing at the moment is I'm completing a documentation audit of all of our Lino collections, which is just basically going through the boxes, making sure what's supposed to be there is there, um, and working out what, what more needs to be done in terms of making our records and improving our records for, for what I find. Um, so the floor coverings in our collections fall into two main categories. So we have actual pieces um, that were um, laid in houses and that have been removed at some point. So the same with the, the piece I showed you at the beginning, a piece of floor cloth, and others which are just sort of plain samples that were sort of uh, shown to customers. Um, I think these ones are much more interesting. They often look a bit more drab because they have been walked on for often a really long time. Um, so we don't know much about the middle one, but I included it because I liked it. Um, but the other two on either side were both manufactured by Barry Osler and Shepard, um, which was the sort of the second biggest firm in Kokodi. Um, the one on the left um, was laid in a manor house in High Wycombe um, about 1895 and was probably removed um, in the 50s. And the one on the right um, was lifted from a house in Kent in 1958, having been laid in 1878. So again, you can see the durability of this material. And especially if you think about in comparison to those other materials that it's mimicking, like carpet and tile, how the colours last and how it's, why it would be appealing to these markets, basically. Um, one drawback of the types of nylon liners that I showed just now um, is that because they are printed with where the designs can rub off, even though apart from that base colour, and so there was a push to try and create a material where that wouldn't be a problem. So again, we have Frederick Walton, who's lost his court battle by this point, re-entering the picture and developing inlaid nylon Lino. <laughs> um, and so this, as you can tell, it's got that kind of pixelated look and it's kind of built up like a mosaic. Um, so each of these pieces are dyed with pigment so the colour goes all the way through so the design won't wear down no matter how much it's walked on. Um, this is very time consuming to make again, um, but is again a very high quality product because of that increased durability. Um, this is made in Kakodi by hand and other places um, mainly by hand, some by machine, and other places in Greenwich, um, it was manufactured um, by machine as well. Um, yeah, and this is also the sort of, in the latter decades of the 20th century, some of us will sort of be used to seeing like lino logos on the floor sort of cut out. This is sort of the forerunner to that and where that, that sort of technology went later and those ideas. Um, then we enter the sort of boom period, which, for Kakodi and for linoleum. And I should say as well, I keep saying Kakodi and that's wrong of me. <laughs> Most of the factories in Fife were in Kakodi, but there was also one in Falkland and one in Nubra, um, which both ran up until, um, up until the um, latter half of the 20th century as well. But the majority of the industry was concentrated in Kakodi. Um, so at the height of the industry, um, was probably from the late 19th century to the mid 20th century. We have several different firms operating in Kakodi. So we have Nairns, which I mentioned, have uh, Barry Osler and Shepherd, uh, and there's also two or three more. Um, 
and by 1914, one in ten people living in Kakadi were employed in the linoleum industry in one capacity or another. Um, these images are all from a pattern book, um, which is basically like a glorified brochure. So we have these big, glossy, full-page colour um, images of, di of different linoleums that customers could pick. Um, and so these are all from a pattern book dating to 1939. And these are all inlaid again. So these are all that sort of mosaic method as opposed to printed. Um, and then this is the like title page of it, which I just, I really like the sort of 3D bit of lino that you've got going on. So I thought I'd include it. Um, and this is actually a really um, interesting, a really sort of part of lino's success is that it was much easier to care for than other, um, other floor coverings. We have a really, I couldn't get a good picture of it on my phone, so I'm sorry I can't share it with you, but we've had um, this really great like metal advert that was produced by a lino film operating in Sweden called Forshaga. Um, and on one side, it's got this sort of like really like overwrought woman, like tearfully scrubbing a floor on her hands and knees. And on the other side, it's got this woman with her big cottage loafed Wardian haircut. And she's just sort of like walking along on her lino and everything's going good for her, obviously. Um, and then another type of boom. Oh, no, it still says click to add text. Ignore that. Another type of boom uh, during the wars. Um, so the image on the right is from the First World War. And this is when women entered the entered the factories. Um, this is again at Barry Osler and Shepherd. Um, and then on the left in the Second World War, um, the Nairn factories um, were producing earthquake bombs. I really love this one because it looks like in a cartoon when a bomb lands and doesn't go off. <laughs> um, so yeah, a lot of the, I was asking our local studies team the other day, oh, what sort of inquiries do we get about the lino industry and lino factories and the thing that we get asked the most is what were they doing during the war and the answer is not making lino so that's a bit of a shame <laughs> um, but we're going to turn that around um, so then we've got the sort of decline um, period so from in the latter decades of the 20th century lino had gained a bad reputation um, partly because of its ubiquity which I mentioned before um, and its durability, um, particularly in working class homes. Um, so this led to it being seen as sort of cheap and old fashioned people. The sort of associations that I had with it coming into this project before I was proved wrong. Um, and that maybe some of you have before you're being proved wrong right now. <laughs> um, the development of vinyl also meant that the two became conflated in many people's minds. So my first experience of lino was my nan getting, my great nan getting vinyl installed in her kitchen. And that was what I associate with. That's why a lot of people think it's plastic. That's why a lot of people think of it as this less durable, um, less durable material. Um, and that's just kind of a bit of an unfair conflation. So the bad qualities of one become associated with the other. Um, Lino still had a place in public buildings, such as schools and hospitals. And um, particularly, there's some really great um, promotional materials that have just come into the collection um, when MRSA first became a concern, because it uh, has antibacterial properties and it was sort of brought back into prominence then um, for sort of use in public buildings. Um, but there was less demand for it in a domestic context nonetheless. Um, so as with so many industries in Scotland and also with many industries in Fife, um, linoleum began to decline. Um, the image on the right, this is from the Fife Free Press, shows workers from Barry's factory, um, which in 1963 announced it was closing five of its six factories in the town. Um, which resulted in mass redundancies. So the firm employed 1,000 people at the time and 600 people were losing their jobs. And this was because, um, partly because they owned another factory in Staines in Middlesex, which was Frederick Wharton's factory, um, where he initially started, and they were sort of centralising production to that. So Kokodi suffered because of it. Um, in this image, you can see them parading through the streets with a coffin made of linoleum at the front there with Barry's written on it. Um, I'm sure this has been lost to the ages, but if anybody happens to know where this coffin is, I'd really like to accession it. So please do let me know if you spot it out and about. Um, and then on the left, this is from um, the Forbo factory. Forbo is the company that um, took over Nairns in the, in 19, in the 80s at some point. Don't test me on it. Um, and this was when one of their factories was demolished. Um, this was found under the floor of the printing room. So this is actually layers and layers of paint that have dripped through the floorboards over decades and decades. Um, and you see you have this kind of like geology of the industry as you go. So I think it's a really cool object um, to show it's, it's how it was once so booming, but now the fact that we have this object is because the factory was being torn down. So it's all very clever. Um, and so 
that's the history. That's why we're doing the project. Hopefully now you can see it's interesting enough. So it's the most interesting subject in the world um, to be doing a project about. Um, so now we're going to talk about what I've been up to and what the team's been up to during the last few months. Um, so the first, one of the first things we're doing is um, developing our existing collections. Um, so we got some funding from the Friends of Kakadi Galleries to do some photography of our existing collections. So we got some of our um, 2D and 3D objects done. So this is uh, medals that were awarded to Nairns at exposition, exposition in Frankfurt. Um, and this is a mosaic of Her Royal Highness Queen Elizabeth II. We've also got one of the Duke of Edinburgh, um, which doesn't look as nice, but still very cool. Um, and this was made um, shortly after the coronation, um, when Lino was still in that boom as well. Um, so we've had those both photographed, which is great. Um, and we're also, as I mentioned before, going through a documentation audit of what we already have, just to sort of improve our knowledge and see where those knowledge gaps are. Um, we're also hoping to do further photography in future to make our collections more accessible. Um, oh, here's some pictures as well. This is, these are some pattern books just to refer back. So we also had these photographed. Um, again, you can see how elaborate, how elaborate these designs are. These are the ones that I always show people when they're like, oh, I don't think I'd want Lino in my house. And it's like, obviously you would. Um, <laughs> um, also had some objects conserved, again, with um, help with funding from um, the Friends of Kakadi Galleries. So this is a floor cloth banner, and these were carried on the sort of um, annual outings of the factories. So you can see the reverse of it there is this beautiful printed lino, and then printed floor cloth, I should say. And then on the reverse, it's got a painting on it. It's kind of like the ones in uh, the trade union image just before. Um, and so we have, there's five of these in our collection, as far as we know, six actually. As far as we know, they're the only ones in existence. Um, three of the, we've got two left to be conserved, and we're hoping to have them conserved in future. This one went out before COVID um, and just came back a few weeks ago because of all the logistical problems that we all experience. So if you'd like to go and see it in the flesh, it's in the Moments in Time Gallery in Kakadi Galleries, um, where it's on permanent display. Um, we're also adding new things to our collections. So this is a donation, again, of a... It's another mosaic made of lino, more nautical themes. Going to do some kind of research in the future into connecting together Titanic and linoleum on ships and ships made of linoleum, as with this one. It's all going to be very exciting. Um, but yeah, this hasn't gone on display yet. We only, um, only took it into our collection in the last few weeks. Um, but it's really, really lovely. And again, these mosaics, I guess, um, are really quite rare. I think we have now five in the collection. We've got two landscapes, the two portraits of Prince Philip and the Queen, and then this one. Um, there are some in situ around the world, but the sort of free, freestanding ones, these are all framed, are, are really quite unusual. So again, if anybody knows of any, um, you don't have to give them to me, but I'd like to know where they are. <laughs> um, we're also working on, um, we've offered the Forbo archive. So Forbo's the only factory still operating, um, producing linoleum in Kakadi and in Britain. Um, and that's on Den Road on the site. It's still in the building of one of the old Nairns factories. Um, so I'm currently going through that at the moment and inventorying it, and then we're sort of bringing over bits from that collection as we go. So these are two examples of that. And the pattern book that I showed a few slides ago is from there as well. Um, so this is a tile of the Nairns logo um, from the 80s that's cut using a process called Aquajet, where they just shoot high-pressured water at Lino to cut it out and slot it all together, which is quite cool. Um, and then the thing on the right is, um, I've actually, we're getting these appraised. We've got two of these. We have one in our collection already, and this one's from the Forbo archive. And we're getting these um, assessed to be conserved at the moment, because you can see there's a little crack on the trunk. Um, but these were, um, the top comes off, and they just had promotional material, just brochures in them, and would just be in like furniture showrooms. Um, there were 3,000 of them made, and they were designed by Eduardo Paolozzi, which is very, <laughs> uh, we don't really know why they're elephants, but. Everything is unusual about it. Um, my boss, Gavin, thinks that it might be because um, part of the big selling point and part of the later advertising campaigns around uh, Lino were about the pressure that it could take. And apparently there's a calculation that if an average sized woman is wearing a stiletto, it has the same amount of pressure as the weight of an elephant. Could be that. Could just be because they liked elephants. Um, could go either way. Um, but yeah, they're really exciting objects and it's re I'm really glad to have two of them now. It's, it's really lovely. Um, 
So what's also good about this archive is that why, where our collection is particularly strong at the moment is from those early years, from the sort of early, uh, late 19th century up until the middle of the 20th century. And the archive is much stronger on those later decades of the 20th century. So bringing this, um, incorporating this into our own collections will really help us to tell the whole of this story and to continue to tell it because it is still, it's still something that people living in Fife are employed in. It's still something that people remember and it's still a part of, of, um, of the county's history. So it will en uh, enable us to keep doing that and to do that more effectively. Um, what else are we on? Oh, also, if anybody in the room still reads like physical papers, we were in the Scotland on Sunday on the 1st of May, and we've been in a few other, few other places since then. And we think we recently got picked, picked up by the Pennsylvania Times, which is quite exciting. Um, <laughs> um, Another thing that we're going to be doing is sort of updating our displays in moments in time in Kakadi galleries. So I've just installed a new display there at the moment, which includes some of the material. The focus on that is on the 4 by archive. Um, and again, this is just sort of increase awareness of the project and to make sure that people understand that the history of Lunar Limit isn't just one thing and that there's lots of different ways that they can engage with it and that, you know, that they can be a part of it and that it can be relevant. Um, so I've just installed a new display there. That will be on on show until, the, until late July. I'm planning on having a sort of three month rotation. Um, and the displays after that, I'm hoping to recruit some volunteers who will sort of do research and select the objects themselves um, and put something together because I think that's really valuable to have people having a hand in their own heritage. I don't just wanna, I don't, just, I don't know if you can tell, but I'm not from round here. Um, <laughs> I don't just wanna turn up and be doing this for people. I wanna sort of, uh, we wanna sort of empower people to come in and be able to help shape their own histories through doing these displays. Um, so two future projects that we're going to be doing is we've recently acquired the share registers of the Tayside Floorcloth Factory, which was in Nubra. Um, so we'd like to have somebody to come in and work on that. And we've also got some trade directories, um, which basically lists where everybody lived in Kakadi and what job they did and who did what in which household and which factory they worked for. Um, and so we'd really like to do some projects on that, maybe... Um, possibly using digital maps, um, TBC. <laughs> um, but these will sort of all work across our collections, so across local history, museums, and libraries. Um, I'm really excited about this photo because this shows workers in 1886, which is one of the years that we have a trade directory for. So we have the potential to be able to match these names up and put, put names to faces um, in some of our collections, which will be very exciting. Um, yeah. And the really exciting thing, the big thing that we're kicking off just now is our oral history project. So this is going to be engaging with linoleum workers past and present. Um, we're casting a really wide net on this because we really want to be able to find out as much as we can. Um, because of the way things are, the focus is we're likely to get more of a response from Kakadi, but we're really keen to hear about people who have these experience in Newbury and Falkland, any role, any time, any length of time. Um, and we're particularly interested in the things I've listed below, so the experience of women in the workplace, of workers who are employed post-1960, um, the role of sort of social activities such as work bands, clubs and sports teams. We've got some really brilliant stuff um, from the Barry's factory about their pipe bands. We've got a Piper's uniform um, in our collection um, and some other really interesting stuff, so I'm really looking forward to exploring that some more. Um, and also the experience of workers involved in industrial actions such as strikes and protests, like in the image of Barry's I showed previously. Um, here's some nice pictures of workers. Um, so we've put a call out to st all staff currently working at the Forbo factory. Um, and we've also included, recent put, um, included this in a recent press release, which I mentioned uh, a minute ago. And we're also put, promoting this on social media. If any of you currently work with anybody who you think might be interested, please do encourage them to get in touch with me. Um, and also, we're keen not just to hear from workers, but anybody whose family worked in the industry, if they want to get in touch, if they've got anecdotes about, you know, mum, dad, grandparents, whatever, really keen to hear about that as well and to hear about the sort of generational impact that the industry has had. Um, lastly, going to be working on some researching some new avenues and making some new connections with our collections. Um, these are all things that I'm thinking about researching over the next year. Um, so linoleum in Oceania. That's how you say that. Um, uh, Nairns had factories in Australia, and it was a big part of the big part of the white Australia um, policy was to sort of bring European industries over to Australia to cater to um, to the uh, 
recently arrived Euro European colonists who were mostly, up until the Second World War, were, the main push was to recruit people from Britain, and a lot of people from Scotland went um, as consumers and as workers. So I'm really interested in looking into that. Um, and also one of the raw materials um, for making lino, um, cowrie gum was used, which is from these giant trees in New Zealand. And we've got some really brilliant photos in our collection, not many of them, but of um, indigenous workers working on the cowrie gum plantations. And so I'm currently um, in conversation with Te Papa in New Zealand and with the Cowrie Gum Museum in New Zealand to try and learn more about that um, and sort of take the local global, as it were. Um, I'm also looking into the sort of Linoleumville idea. So this was an actual town in Staten Island called Linoleumville because it was all built around a factory, but interested in the way that these, this industry shaped and continues to shape the places that, that it existed. Um, so in Kakadi, for example, a lot of the civic buildings were funded by linoleum or by the people that made their money in linoleum, including Kakadi Galleries, um, which is part of a... It's the only war memorial in the world that includes a gallery, library, and museum. Um, and it was funded by, by the Nairn family. Um, ships, as I previously mentioned, also going to be looking into interior design, because why wouldn't you? Um, and also linoleum housework and gender roles. So again, sort of using that idea of how did this change... How did this change domestic work and what did this mean for our sort of expectations of all of those variables? Um, I think that's it from me. I'd really love to have some questions. And if any of you want to get in touch in future, you can email lino at onfife.com. Thanks. <laughs>you spoke a lot about especially at the end about gender roles and linoleum and you had that example where you even talked about an Edwardian woman mm. saying that how bre easy breezy her life was now that she had linoleum in my mind I when I envision linoleum or lino I think of a 50s housewife oh. now is that a conflation with vinyl when it came in or is it do you have like a lot of examples of 50s advertisements and the rise of linoleum, was there like a second wave of the popularity then? When it is that when it became mass produced? It's Many always, questions. <laughs> so it's always been both mass produced and not mass produced in a way. So one of the things we did at the beginning of the project was we went on a tour of the factory that's still operating in Kakadi. And it's really surprising how little the process has changed. Like all of the raw materials are still the same. It's, they only make... Um, marbled linoleum now so it's available lots of different colors but just that sort of mixed pattern um, but it still has to be the factory is really tall and that's because it still has to be stored in these big ovens where it's like layered up like a vionetta and baked to sort of mature it's still all that process is still the same so it is there is that kind of it is mass produced but it still has that kind of natural and almost artisanal element to it which I think has always been present um, which is really quite interesting, I think. Um, in terms of the, its role in the 50s, that is what a lot of people think of. And I think, from what I can tell so far, there's sort of two bits to that, which is partly because, as with that example of the Edwardian woman, that is the kind of advertising and the way marketing was being done in the 50s in that very, like, mad men way, you know? Um, that it was all sort of part of being a, a successful modern woman in the 50s was having this sparkling home. And one of the ways to do that, even if you're entering the workforce and they're going to have less time, is to have sort of time-saving things at home. And that, that's actually what is also sort of happening in the Edwardian period as well, is that there is that sort of, that balance is shifting between work outside the home and work inside the home. So I think that that's just a sort of trend that repeats itself. Um, another thing that seems to be that it... So in the... Edwardian period and the late Victorian period, there was a shift towards actually being, it's not a term we really use in this country, but being a homemaker so that you would, the woman would be in charge of the design and that was sort of a, an acceptable pursuit for women was like selecting the things that were going to be in your home, whereas previously it was like, well, does it keep the draft out? My husband will buy it, whatever. And it became something that women would do as sort of a pursuit. Um, and you kind of, again, have that repeated in the 40s, 50s, 60s, where one of the things that is really... Um, one of the things that's heavy in the marketing is you have a lot of illustrations of women installing lino in their homes because it is quite easy to install. Um, 
And I never, I never know how to feel about these adverts, whether they should be like empowering of like, this is showing a woman making things happen, or if it's like, it's so simple, even a woman could do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there is definitely, that is another time when it's very visible. And I think a lot of, in the later half of the 20th century, the bad associations that we have with it are of Lino that was laid in that time, like going around older relatives' house and it's been there for decades. And you're like, oh, <laughs> everything in this house is tacky and needs to be torn out and is no good. But actually, you know, there was, was a, lot of, a lot of good in it, I think, and a lot of things that could do with being saved. We're just not used to having things that last that long anymore as well, which I think also contributed to its decline. Anyway, that was an extra answer for free. <laughs> So you said you were really keen to have the local population, the local community involved. And how positive is the feeling about Lino locally? And I'm so, just thinking that you go to Kakodi, it's mm. still declining from what I can see. Mm. Over the, it, is there any anger over the fact that the Lino industry disappeared? I think that's always inevitable when you have... <laughs> I think... Not to get not to cast the net too wide, but I think people are always basically angry that we don't live in the past <laughs> in some sense. Um, but I do think obviously where jobs and livelihoods are concerned, it is always really sensitive and it can be very emotional for some people. Um, so far, we're really at the beginning stages of that. And so far, my um, interactions with people who have worked in the industry has been really positive. They've been quite interested to talk about it and it's still kind of represents quite the people that I've spoken to so far, it's still kind of representing quite a big part of their lives, that there was still the idea of, which is obviously, you know, we've been talking today about like temporary contracts and stability, very much n almost a thing of the past, but the idea of like a job for life. And some of the people that I've spoken to so far still did sort of enter into the industry with that and did have that to an extent, would have sort of decades of work. Um, and also it was often a generational thing. So um, some of the people that I've spoken to so far had, they worked in it and they're, their parents worked in it and so I think that even if there there is definitely a sadness about the loss of the, the decline of the industry um, I haven't experienced much anger yet but I'm sure that there will be something to navigate because it, it is difficult and as you say when when you are still in an area where there hasn't actually been recovery another industry hasn't come in to replace it or where um, in Kakodi and, and in other parts of Fife as well, in, in Falkland and Newborough, this is also sort of the case, where there was another industry, whether that was... So in Kakodi, it was coal. Um, and that also sort of went at the same time or went at a similar time, and these sort of things were all sort of tied up with each other. Um, and, yeah, I mean that that recovery is harder. So my answer is I don't quite know yet, but I expect to encounter all range of emotions <laughs> as we go through this. But, yeah. Yes. Thank you. You've hooked me in, Lily, because I've got four questions. <laughs> Sorry. Some are quite specific. So you showed a slide, which I think it's had Rockabye Baby on. Yeah, so I'll go back to it. was that specifically designed for, like, a nursery room? So what, did they deliberately do... Like designs for particular rooms? This your museum it... of childhood head. Yeah, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's a, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so we have, as you mentioned, this is definitely for a nursery. There's another piece in, we've got two other pieces actually in our collection. One's on display in Moments in Time, in the Moments in Time gallery and the other's in our store. Um, that are sort of, one is like um, sort of your flaxen head, like kids frolicking yeah. and another one is like it's sort of um sort of kings and queens kind of look to uh -huh. it and they're both on like a green background um but yeah this was definitely they were specifically designed okay. for nurseries and this one on the right um is specifically designed for an entrance hall so this is based on a um a mosaic in Carthage so it's very that sort of late Victorian grand you know welcome to my villa kind of thing um but yeah you have a lot of stuff that's very specifically for those rooms and as well it's in the same way that we would cringe now if you went into a kitchen and it was carpeted sorry if anybody has that I would cringe at that because um, I'd worry about the maintenance and stuff it's that same kind of thing where it's like rooms where children are all the time it's better if they're dry wipe and people, places where people have muddy boots it's better if it's dry wipe so it's that same kind of thing where it's sort of angling towards those different things but yeah we've got quite a few examples of nursery themes so question two and three <laughs> 
Have you found any racist imagery in any of the designs? And also what, to your mind, is the most unusual design you've found? No racist stuff yet, but it seems to go hand in hand with yeah, nursery rhymes. Yeah, it's usually they're lurking somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one thing that... There is one of the things that... Um, some of the stuff that is already in our collection and some of the stuff that's part of the archive is things that were produced produced by workers, so sort of like internal um, like newspapers or like joke newspapers and, and postcards and things like that. And some of those are a bit blue. Um, <laughs> um, and also in terms of, again, not, not with, um, with race as an issue, but more, more with both of these things, more towards um, gender. Mm. But um, some of the advertising is very, there's, um, there's one that I absolutely love and it's a load of um, like, scantily clad showgirls. It's a photo, I think it's from the 70s or 80s. Um, and it says something like, it says something like, it's something like we'll cover it up no matter what or something right. like that is the tagline. Um, and it's all about, and then it's all the text on the side is like, oh, if you're wearing stilettos like these showgirls do, you'll need lino, but that's not, that's the subtext, it's not the text of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and there's another one of a hospital corridor and it says something like, this floor takes the weight of 30 trolleys and blah, 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 and blah, 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 and matron. Oh. Um, and so there's all sort of that kind of stuff, yeah, um, yeah. which I think is really interesting and I'm really looking forward to displaying because I think it's, as with any of this stuff where we sort of look at it now and go, oh God, it's really interesting how, how how quickly and how slowly that conversation has changed in terms yeah, of in terms yeah. of that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff still to be found, yeah. um, and definitely some stuff that it's going to take some thinking about. Um, so, oh, and, yeah, go on. Sorry, oh, go on. I was going to say I really like these designs. They're probably my two favourite. Um, but we also have, I think I posted it on our social media recently, a really brilliant example um, that was designed for Northeastern Railway, and it's like a big circle with all different crests in it, and it says Northeastern Railway. And I think it was. I think it was used on trains. I need to get in touch with STEAM and the Railway Museum because I think, I think they might have more information and have some, have some samples of it themselves. Um, but yeah, it's just all really, I just like the really ornate over the top stuff because um, it's just not what we associate with Lino at all. Mm -hmm. um, and I really like how grandiose it is basically. Yeah, I was just going to say, as an aside, the 70s advertising is like really wow. I was looking at a Jackie magazine the other day oh, and it yeah. was basically saying to young women who were reading the magazine, um, go and work in for a bank be on the counter. Obviously, you can't work behind the scenes um, because you will meet your new husband, yeah. the male customer. <laughs> and it had like a picture of a young man at the counter and the woman behind. The and I was just like, oh, my God. Anyway, my fourth question was, where did the raw materials come from was that locally or overseas overseas so the with the the cap the backing is canvas or jute so that would often be the raw materials will come in via dundee um and then for the can't quite remember where the cork from i think the cork came from sometimes from south america and then later sometimes from australia um and the resin the gum resin is from indonesia but then, as I said, they also use cowrie gum from New Zealand as well. So this is definitely a, definitely an empire product, um, which is really interesting. And as well, the pigments um, come from all over the place as well, from all the same places that you would expect pigment for anything to come from, um, and similar sources of like, you know, stones and, and rare woods and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something to look into as well because it is just infrastructure to support that and the sort of connections that that made as well because then the products would also be sold all over the world as well and sort of go back out so I found a article in St Andrew's Museum to do with the factory in Newborough the Tayside Floor Cloth Company and it was from the 60s or 70s and it was like their little delivery van loaded up with all of these samples and I think it was going to to lay the floor it was going to Singapore Thailand and to lay the floor at the Grand Mosque in Addis Ababa as well and that so it's like all all going all over the place flooring the world <laughs> um, but yeah it's definitely one of those things where it's all everything's coming in and everything's going out but obviously the power imbalance in that is huge um, and it's something that I think is really gonna really gonna take a lot of research um, just to go quickly back to the Jackie example that you have another um, advert that we have 
it's got a, I think it's from the 80s, it's very sort of power suity, and it's a woman sitting at a desk, and it's like, um, it's something about, again, about the pressure that Lino can take, and it's like, oh, it can, um, it can withstand whichever, whichever legs are on it, whether that's of a Queen Anne desk or the shapely legs of your secretary. <laughs> it's so gross. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, this is more from, do you know when you get an old house and you've got wallpaper on wallpaper on wallpaper? Yeah. Well, I have an old house and I've got lino on lino on lino. <laughs> and I was wondering, how do you go about dating the lino? Because I wanted to see if it was original to the house. That's, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, but I'll find out. We'll exchange details. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, lino is really hard to date because especially... I'll just go back to another slide. All of these examples are from 1939, but I think that the bottom... I could be convinced that the bottom right was Victorian, and I could be convinced that the top right was from the 70s. Like, it's really hard. A lot of the... A lot of the, the this kind of designs that Lino is good at doing, it continues to be good at doing, and it's those, the kind, those are the kind that persist. And there sort of are these variations in, in colour and different things like that, but it can be really hard to put, put a finger on them, especially as if you are looking um, in the 20th century. Um, if the house is older, it will be... How old is the house? 1922. Ooh. It's a home for heroes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, if it was older, then you might have, like, floor cloth, the older material at the very bottom. Um, I'm not sure, but I'd really like to look into it with you. Okay. <laughs> now we're networking. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? I've got, I've got one. Um, <laughs> uh, the Oral Histories Project, I know you yeah. haven't started it yet, but can you talk about like, how you're going to go about doing that, and are you going to recruit volunteers or staff? Yeah. So I think it's probably going to be me doing the interviews. Um, which will be a new challenge for me. Oh, so I had some training with the, um, the Living Memory Association um, who are down in Leith. They're really brilliant. If anybody's thinking about doing something similar, um, they do oral history training and reminiscence session training, which is really great. Um, so as I say, we, me doing the interviews, and I'm kind of... The research that I've done it so far, and I've been talking to friends that have worked on similar projects, and I'm really kind of keen... Again, so another sort of theme of the day for this to sort of be um, really to be shaped by the participants. So if they want to be interviewed with alongside their partner or alongside a friend or alongside somebody they used to work with, then that's fine. And if they want to be interviewed at home or if they would rather come in, you know, I'm going to try. I'm trying to keep it really flexible because, like of anything, once you get people talking about anything, then they're talking. But initially, it can be quite an intimidating thing to do, and. It, the experience that I've had with a lot of people, we've had quite a few people get in touch already just from the call-outs that we've put out on social media and in the press. Um, but a lot of people sort of say like, oh, I'm not going to be any... Um, they sort of write and go, oh, I worked at this factory for this amount of time. And sometimes it's like years. Um, and they sort of say like, oh, but I, you know, I'm not going to be able to help because I don't remember enough or I don't have anything interesting to tell you or whatever. And I, I'm a... I'm a big imposter syndrome person, so I, I really relate to that. Um, and I'm really keen to sort of... I'm trying to think about what sort of things would make me feel more comfortable and also to see how they might apply to other people just to sort of offer those options. Um, so in terms of the format, the how and the where it's going to happen, that's still... I re I'm really keen to keep that flexible. Um, we are planning on recruiting volunteers to help with transcribing. Um, but transcribing... It requires a certain set of uh, skills. <laughs> um, not everybody has the, has the patience for it. I've yet to find out if I have the patience for it, uh, but we'll see how it goes. Um, but yeah, I think, it'll, I think it will be... I think we're also... Um, it's the kind of thing in terms of getting people to actually come and talk and to record their memories. It's that sort of thing that kind of snowballs, where people do talk to people that they know. And I've already had some people 
sort of go, oh, you should speak to so-and-so, and it turns out that so-and-so has already emailed me, and they're sort of passing me on to third people and things like that. So I think it's the sort of thing where, in terms of getting people to come along, it will sort of happen, hopefully happen quite organically as well, and that that will make people feel more comfortable with it. Um, but, yeah, that's the thinking at the moment, at least. hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, you spoke about, at the very beginning, that linoleum is biodegradable. Yeah. Do you see then, with people looking forward in terms of building materials that are more um, environmentally sustainable, you spoke about how you know the resources to actually make linoleum we do have to import from mm. far away, but do you see that there is the possibility that linoleum could move into a different market with different kind of techniques and building in Scotland yeah. to kind of heal the wound, as Adam alluded to? <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I, um, I was talking to somebody the other day, I can't remember who this was, so that isn't very helpful, because it might have just been pub talk. <laughs> um, it might not have any authority behind it. Um, but apparently it's a, a bit of a thing in interior design at the moment to have like a bit of lino as your statement wall. Um, apparently that's a thing that people are doing. Um, I think there's definitely room for it, but I think it's just... As with anything that kind of needs its image rehabilitated, it's whether the rebrand is stronger than the memory of it being the sort of bad associations. Um, in the factory, the 4 by factory, whose archive I'm working on at the moment, um, they have a little video loop in their lobby. And I've only caught snippets of it, and I've been really remiss and not looked into this properly yet. But on it, it says that, that Kim Kardashian and Kanye West have Lino in their bathroom. So. Maybe it will, maybe it will, you know, if it, the lino lasts longer than their marriage, and that will be a good little advert for it, <laughs> and it will be fine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's definitely possible, because, because as I say, so much about that process is still, is still as it was. And the great thing about it, when we went around the factory, is that all the stuff that is, um, anything that's not up to standard, or as I mentioned, those big rolls where it's hung up to dry, any bit where it's touching a roller, it leaves an imprint. So you have to cut it every 30 meters. Um, and those, so it's like a foot every 30 meters that you have to cut out. Um, and that is waste. But all of that is just ground straight up and goes back in to the thing. So there's actually pretty much no waste from the process. Um, so from a circular economy, it's really interesting as well. So it's like, I can see it ticks all these boxes in terms of sustainability. It's just, I think it's, I think it's partly an aesthetic thing and partly whether, because you know, the sort of marble look isn't for everybody. Um, but I think, I think it's just if it can, if the rebrand is strong enough to overcome the brand, then yeah. But I think there's no reason why it shouldn't. It's just if it does. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I was just had a thought when you were speaking. Is it only lino you're doing, or are you doing oil cloth as well? Um, so, oil cloth is sort of the precursor with the floor cloth as well. Um, so, the industry in Kakadi started with that, and so that's part of the story as well. But most of it has been lino, so most of what I'm doing will be lino. But also included in our collections are those earlier examples of oil cloth, floor cloth, and wax cloth. Um, so yeah, anything goes basically. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.